Hey, let's go to the Word of God. Judges chapter 6. Um, we're going to read verse 1 through 6 and uh, then work on that a little bit. The Bible says, again, is the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Somebody shout again. And for seven years, he gave them into the hand of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. And whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. And they camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way from Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. And they came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count the men and their camels. They invaded the land and ravaged it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. One translation says the Midianites so um, overwhelmed them. They they so impoverished them. It's this idea that they, they cut off any bit of livelihood that they could have. And so they cried out to the Lord for help. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. Holy Spirit, speak to us. We haven't come just to do some religious exercise. We've come that we would hear from heaven. So deposit something in our soul. We believe the word of God is a seed and will bear good fruit in our life. And so we're ready to receive it in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Amen. If you're the note-taking type, um, write this down. If you're not, go ahead and write it down. Here's your title, Come Out of the Cave. Come out of the cave. So my son asked me the other day, I have four children. Any, anybody, any parents in, in the house today? Any parents? Okay, good. Um, God bless you. Uh, we have four kids. We have 16 um, who is now driving solo. And my insurance doubled, y'all. Uh, driving solo. And uh, then I have a 14-year-old daughter who is all things cheerleading. And uh, just had a competition the other day. And that's the most nerve-wracking thing I've ever done in my life. Um, and uh, stunts and pom-poms and bows, and I'm down. I'm, I'm for it all. I got a T-shirt that says Faith's Dad on the back and a big pom-pom on the front. Like, I'm here for it. I'm supporting my girl. Um, then, I, then we took a big break on purpose, and uh, we have a 7-year-old, and uh, then we adopted a 4. He's 4, be 5 uh, next month. And uh, so my oldest, Owen, so I have boys on the end, girls in the middle, and uh, my oldest, whose name is Owen, he's like, hey, Dad, the other day, he's like, did you ever pull an all-nighter? And I was like, yeah, I pulled several all-nighters in college. Um, and I said, there were many times that I would, you know, get to the, the computer lab. Some of y'all don't know about that. Back in the day when you went to college, you didn't have no laptop in your room, <laughs> bougie people. Um, you didn't have no laptop. You had to go to the computer lab. Anybody remember the computer lab, okay? And you took your disk drive with you because you had all your files on the disk drive. Ain't no cloud. Clouds are in the sky. It's not where you saved a file. And uh, so you took your disk drive in there, and you waited for somebody to get up. And when they got up, then you took your spot, and, uh, and then you would type all night, and then at 7 a.m., go to breakfast, and then roll up in class like you had that thing ready the whole time. <laughs> Throw some water on your face. Don't look so tired to your professor, right? I said, I pulled many of those. And as I'm telling this, I'm also calculating in my mind. I'm like, oh, wow, am I justifying for him to procrastinate till the last minute. Are y'all following me? Because your sins will find you out. You reap what you sow, right? All those things. And so I'm trying to figure out how to let him know. And this is what I said to him. I said, but, bud, I worked great under pressure. I was trying to turn this <laughs> into something positive. I was like, I kind of like the pressure. Anybody else with me? I really did. I thought I was more creative under pressure. I thought when the pressure was on, I, I like executed quicker. I thought I brought better ideas. I kind of like pressure. Some of you, you're breaking out in hives right now. Like the thought, you were like, no, I had my homework done a month beforehand. I opened the syllabus and immediately completed every assignment. <laughs> Everybody hated you. You broke the curve. All of us got C's. We could have had a B plus. It was your fault. Um, but I'm just kidding. We don't hate you. We love you in the name of Jesus. And, uh, but you were that person, not me. I was like last minute, like pressure. I liked it. I, I liked the pressure. And how many of you know that, um, that pressure is just the reality of life, is it not? 
that we all face pressure. Even if you're here and you're like, I don't even know if I believe in Jesus and this whole God thing, the reality is you have pressure. It's the commonality of humanity is that we all face pressure. We, we face financial pressures. We face relational pressures. We, we face work pressures. We face school pressures. There are pressures that come at us from all kinds of different angles, and I think that, that they're really boiled down to two kind of things. One is life sends pressures. There, there's nothing you did to, to invite it. There, there's, you didn't choose it. You didn't sign up for it. Um, but just pressure came. It was the unexpected diagnosis. It was, um, it was the layoff from work that you didn't expect to get. It was the downturn in the economy. It was the company went out of business. It was um, they walked away from you and you never thought that would happen. Um, they stabbed you in the back and you thought there was deep loyalty there. Life sends, somebody shout pressure. It's pressure and it's, and it's constant, it's consistent, and it's no respecter of persons. But there's other kind of pressure that comes, and if we're real honest, it's because of choices we make, right? The Bible says that uh, the Midi- that Israel did evil again. I'm glad Joshua added in there, again, in the eyes of the Lord. If you want me to give you an Old Testament survey, um, I've done a lot of s- more school than I, I should have, and I'll, I'll, I'm going to take you to seminary real quick. You're all with me? Say amen. Here's Old Testament survey. God blesses the nation of Israel. They live in prosperity. It's fruitful. Everything's going their way. They begin to think they can do life on their own. So they decide they don't need God anymore. And then they get the consequences of deciding they don't need God anymore. Not because God is mean and cruel, but God's like, if you don't want me involved, I'm not going to push myself on you. I don't have to be involved if you don't want me involved. And so they get the consequences of God not being involved in their life, and they're never good, by the way. Then they cry out to the Lord. And then what does God do? Because he's full of grace and compassion and mercy. He comes and he rescues them. And then what does he do? He begins to bless them and prosper them. And then what does Israel do? Israel goes, God, we think we can do this on our own. Are you all with me? And then Israel ends up in a very bad place. And then what happens? They cry out to the Lord. And this is the cycle over and over. Like the blessing of God. God, I can do this without you now. I got things covered. And then God goes, okay, do it your way. Then doing life your way never turns out good. And then God, they cry out to God and God. And that sounds like Israel, but it also sounds like me. And I'm not your pastor. I don't know you well enough, but maybe it sounds like you. That God blesses, God favors, God does what God does, and then we begin to go, oh, life is good, I can do this on my own. And then we decide in doing life on our own, we reap the consequences of that, and what happens? Pressure comes in our life. Are y'all tracking with me? And pressure will do one of two things to you. It will either refine you, or it will confine you. It'll either refine you or confine you. Refining is a, is a process you go through, and what comes out on the other side is better. A refining process is beneficial in our lives. Matter of fact, I was reading about this, this idea of pressure when I was thinking of this message, and I found out that um, to create a diamond, it takes extremely high heat, but 725,000 pounds of pressure per square inch. So the pressure is a gift in the moment because it's producing something that could not be produced without the pressure. Now, I don't think the carbon atoms, you're like, I didn't go to school today. I'm in a school, I didn't plan to go to school. No, we did for a minute. There, there, there's, there's these carbon atoms and it takes that pressure, but there's no carbon atom going, this is awesome. I mean, I don't know what carbon atoms sound like. They don't have a voice, but I'm just, are y'all with me? You got to use your imagination sometimes, right? I don't think there's any carbon atoms that like, I love this pressure. This is wonderful. This feels so nice to me. But how many of you know that the carbon atom becoming something of value like a diamond is really good? And I would propose to you that there are some things that only can come through pressure. That I'm not saying God sends it into your life, but I do believe I serve the God that has the ability of taking all things and working them together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. I would propose to you that there are some characteristics in your life that can only be produced and it's on the other side of pressure. That there are some dreams and some destinies. There are some comfort places you would never get pushed out of if there wasn't some pressure and the pressure pushes you to a place that you never would have gone by yourself but it's a place that God wants to take you 
hello Adele. I would say on the other side of pressure, it's calling out from the other side. On the other side of pressure is breakthrough. On the other side of pressure is miracles. On the other side of pressure is healing. I wonder if there's anybody that's been through pressure that can testify that God is the God that turns what the enemy meant for evil and he turns it for good. He meant the diagnosis for evil, but he turned it for good. He meant the relational pressure for evil, but God turned it for good. He meant the job loss for evil, but God turned it for good. Because on the other side of pressure, God has a way of turning it for good. Because pressure has a way of refining you. Some of you are in a refining season. You're in a refining moment. You're, you're in a, a season where you're like, God, what are you doing? Where are you, God? And I just want to speak life over you and say, oh, God's working. Even when you can't see it, he's not working. Just because he does not talk to you doesn't mean he isn't talking to your solution. The nation of Israel was in 400 years of bondage. And Moses cried out to God. The people of Israel cried out to God. And God didn't talk to Israel. He talked to Moses. He didn't talk to them. He talked to their deliverer. So whenever you're crying out to God, the ear of God is not too deaf that he can hear you, nor the arm of God, according to the Bible, too short, that he can't reach down into your situation. So in moments where you're crying out to God and you don't hear God, it doesn't mean that God isn't working. It just means that God may be talking to the answer. And this is what is happening with Israel and the Midianites. And pressure will refine you, but pressure will also confine you and this is what's happening to Israel at this moment if you're with me say amen Amen. the Bible says that evil Israel did evil again in the eyes of the Lord and then the Midianites came on them because when you decide to do life your own way God will let you do your life your own way and so the Midianites came in and for seven years the Midianites are putting immense pressure on Israel they're taking all of their livestock. They're coming in and wiping out at all their agriculture. They're, they're continuing to put pressure year after year, moment after moment. The Bible even says that, that Israel would go out. They would, they would come out to plant some crops, and immediately Midian would come in. They'd come in with their camels, and the men and the camels were too many to count. They would just swarm in and they would impoverish the people of Israel. But here's what the scripture says. It says that when Israel did evil again in the eyes of the Lord and Midian came in and put pressure on them for seven years. And then it says this. It said, and Israel made made shelters for themselves in caves and strongholds. I want you to notice that it didn't say when the pressure came that Israel made shelters. Or that Midian made shelters. It said that Israel made it in the caves. Midian didn't come up and go, we're going to put you in little caves and lock you away. Israel made it for themselves. I would propose to you that when the pressure is on, if you don't allow it to refine you, it will confine you. And the enemy of your soul doesn't have to lock you away in a cave. You'll lock yourself there. You don't have to... The enemy doesn't have to rob your joy. You'll give your joy away with enough pressure. With enough pressure on you. you, The enemy doesn't have to come. And I I don't even know if he can steal your destiny. But you'll give your destiny away when there's enough pressure put on them. The Bible says that they made shelters for themselves in caves and strongholds. In other words, they physically, literally shrunk themselves down into a space that was smaller than the call of God on these people. It's a metaphor for what I believe that we do. We begin to shrink ourselves down. We begin to shrink our dream down into the size that we think it can fit into the space that we now occupy because of the pressure that has been on us. We will shrink our joy down into the level that we think it can be contained. We begin to shrink ourselves back. We begin to walk back on what God has called us to. We begin to walk back on faith that we once thought that we have. Why? When the pressure comes on, the enemy will cause you to shrink yourself. 
cause you to believe for less, to, to step back, to shrink back from calling, to shrink back from purpose, to shrink back from ministering and doing the things that God has called, to shrink back from believing that child will come home, to shrink back from believing that marriage will be restored. The enemy will put pressure on you, and the pressure sometimes is enough to cause you to shrink yourself. We'll begin to say things, well, this is just my lot in life. It just is what it is. We say these phrases that are so common among us. And what we're saying is, I don't think this can ever change. I don't think I can do anything about this. So I'm just going to accept. Listen to this. I'm going to accept to live my life at a level that is below the inheritance I have in God. Caves were not the inheritance of the nation of Israel. It is not the word that God spoke to Abraham. And God is not a man that he should lie. And if he said, Abraham, I'm going to give you something, then, then Israel deserved to have it. And if he said, Abraham, I'm going to multiply you, then they should have been multiplied. But they were shrinking back and living in these caves. These are the people of cloud by day and fire by night. These are the people of Jericho walls falling. They should not be shrinking themselves back. These are the people of the Red Sea crossing. These are the people that had seen God do the miraculous in their life. And they forgot who their God was. And they run and made little shelters and caves because the enemy put a little bit of a pressure on them. And we do the same thing in our life. And we forget who God is when we forget who we are. That we are children of the Most High God. And we begin to view God through the limit of our imagination instead of through the lens of who He is. I think about Naaman. If you're with me, say amen. Amen. I think about Naaman. If you remember the story of Naaman, he had leprosy and his servant girl said, there's a prophet, you should go to the prophet. He went to the prophet and he said, I want you to go. The prophet didn't even come out and talk to him. And Naaman was like, I'm somebody. Like he should come out and speak to me. And he said, go out and dip in the Jordan seven times. And the Jordan is a disgusting river, if you've ever been there and seen it. Not the tourist section in Israel where they all get baptized. I'm talking about the real crossing. It is dirty. You, can't, like, you put your hand an inch down, you don't see your hand. So I understand why he was like, that's not sanitary. <laughs> Let me go find somewhere else to dip. And so he, we went, he, he, and he said this. This is what he said. He said, He was so offended, and he goes, I thought the prophet would come out and wave his hand over me or something and speak a word. The two first words in that sentence were his problem, I thought. In other words, he was saying, I had a plan of how the prophet should do it and the way the prophet should do it, and how many of us, we get to God and we go, God, you should do it this way, and you should do it that way, and God is go, I'm not limited by your thoughts. I'm not limited by your imagination. Could this be why Ephesians 3.20, Paul wrote, he's immeasurably more than we can ask, think, or imagine some of us have given God how to do it in our life, how to fix our marriage, how to restore our finances, how to bring our kid back, how to open up, and we are limiting God by our imagination. Can I tell you something? God is beyond your imagination. His ways are not my ways. His thoughts are higher than my thoughts. I'm going to, God, do it the way you want to do it. Do it when you want to do it. Do it how you want to do it. I'm not going to live in you. I'm not going to shrink back. I'm not going to limit you, God, by what I can think. Israel thought the best response was shelters in caves. Instead of believing for God to bring them deliverance. Instead of believing God to to bring them out. And so it confined them. And you know what? When I read the text, I... I'm empathetic towards them. I'm empathetic that they would decide to live in caves. And you're like, but you just preached about having faith and don't limit God and your imagination. But think about it for a moment. I think when you read the text, you have to get into the text and really think about it. Think about this for seven years, everybody. I get a little courage. We're starving in here. The Bible says they impoverish them. 
In other words, they cut off food source to them. So there's a level of desperation, right? And so they, they decide to go out and they plant a little bit of crops. The crops start growing, and then Midianite wipes them out again. Okay, first time, not bad. I got some resiliency. I can go get a, I go out and plant again. Midianites, Amalekites, and all the other eastern peoples come and wipe everything out again. At some point, no matter how much faith you have, humanity goes, yeah, I'm not trying again. Are you with me? Yeah. I'm not trying again. Like, and I wonder if you felt that. Like, Okay, I tried, I tried to restore that relationship, and I'm not getting burned again on that. Yeah, I tried, I tried to love them again, and I, I'm not. I got my hand slapped again. And man, I, I started being faithful in the tithes and returning that to God because it belongs to Him anyway and return and giving an offering above that. And, and, and then it seems like all hell broke loose in my finances and I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to shrink back. I kind of get it. I kind of understand it. I, I tried to forgive and, and the moment I forgave, then, then I felt like I got burned again. It's just, it's a lot easier to stay back in caves. It's a lot easier to shrink back. It's a lot easier to just like, just us four and no more. And I'm just going to kind of create my own little world. And I'm just going to live in this cave. It's not everything that God has for me. And, and I hear pastor talking about the, the blessing that God wants from my life. And living by faith and believing for greater. But I'm just telling you, I've tried it. And the Midianites keep coming and wiping out my crops. And they keep coming and blowing everything up again. And I'm not going to try again. Oh, I'll show up. I'm, I want to go to heaven. But I'm just going to live this limited life. This shrinking back life. I'm just going to stay in the cave. And I kind of get it. Because it's hard when it feels like you try and get knocked down and you try and you get knocked down and you try and get knocked down. But the Bible says the righteous fall seven times, but they keep getting back up. It's the mark of us. We keep getting back up. And here's why I also think, and it's, it's not explicit in the text, but I, I think it does no justice, injustice to the text, is that it's also easy to stay in the caves when everybody else is in the cave that you run with. All of Israel, all right, I don't think I'm, I'm stepping outside the bounds of the context of the text. Are y'all with me? It says all of Israel were in the caves. And so it's real easy when you're surrounded by, I want to call them cave creatures. This is why it's important, the people you put around you. It's why getting in a small group here is so important. Why? Because some of you, you live around cave creatures. You come in here and you experience God and something gets filled up in you. But then you go right back to school. You go right back to work. You maybe go right back into your house. If they're with you, just look straight ahead like you don't know what I'm talking about. And you are surrounded by cave creatures. Cave creatures are always looking backward. They're never looking forward. Cave creatures are always talking about the way it used to be, never talking about what it could be. And cave creatures don't want you to excel and they don't want you to prosper and they won't want you to move forward because your more forward movement shines a light on their lack of movement. And they are much more comfortable to claw you back into the cave. Just stay in the cave. The moment you begin to step out and go, no, I'm going to get in some community that is full of faith. No, I'm going to get on a team and begin serving. No, I'm going to get obedient in my finances. No, I'm going to start reading my Bible and praying. No, I'm going to start forgiving those who have hurt me. I'm going to start loving those who don't like me. I'm going to start serving the city and making a difference outside the walls of the church. I'm going to come to Miracle Offering full of faith with a gift that honors God. And the cave creatures around you be like, oh, well, you just too good for anybody now aren't you oh you just think you're somebody oh you're just holy now you holy roller now oh you just think you're something no 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 I'm just determined that I won't live in the cave anymore I've just determined that it's been far too long that I've lived in a cave that I put myself in the enemy didn't put me there my mom and dad didn't put me there enough pressure came on and I put myself there I started shrinking back and living it with limited thinking and limited faith but it's not time for me to live that way anymore I'm coming out of the cave. And here's the deal. If you live in the cave too long, your cave will become a tomb. Your cave will become the place that your dreams die. 
And the cave will become the place that vision dies in your life. And the cave will become that something on the inside of you dies. You may still show up. You may be walking. You may go to work. You may go to school. You may come into church. You may tune in online. You may do all the things. But you can be in the building and not be present. You can show up and have no faith. You can live in the same house legally married but have no intimacy in the marriage you can still be sitting at the dinner table with your kids but not parenting you can show up in the office but not be working you can go to school but not really be in school and you will live and things will die on the inside of you and that is the enemy's goal he came to steal to kill and to destroy and a lot of times he doesn't have to come and kill things himself and destroy himself. He just have to put enough. He just have to send Midian to put enough pressure on you. And you'll forfeit yourself. And caves will turn into tombs. And I just want to speak over your life that this may be a season, but it's not a life sentence. That you may not be able to see a way, but we serve the God that is a way maker. I feel like God sent me today to tell somebody it's time to get out of the cave. It's time to come out of the cave. I speak in the name of Jesus. It's time for you to come out of the cave. Stop shrinking back. Stop stepping back. Stop living with limited thinking. Get out of the cave. You serve the God of the Red Sea parting. You serve the God of the cloud by day and fire by night. You serve the God who is immeasurably more than you can ask, think, or imagine. Get out of the cave. But how? I love what our friend Holly Furtick says. She goes, hallelujah, but how? Like, I know not here because you have good preaching, but I've been to church before where I was like, yes, amen, preach it. I got in the car, I was like, what do I do now? <laughs> like, I'm fired up, but I have no idea where to go. Like, I'm fired up, but I don't know what to do tomorrow morning. So real quick, let me give you how. We said hallelujah. Let me tell you how. It's found in the next few verses. I should have brought my reading glasses. I'm 40. I'm in my 40s, y'all. It's real. It is real. These small print Bibles, they're from the devil. Your boy's about to get a large print. Man. It says, when the, when the Israelites cried, cried to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet. And just, this is free. Because whenever you cry out to God, God will always give you a word. Some of you are crying to God, waiting for God to do something. God will give you a word for you to do something, and the miracle comes on the other side of you responding to the word. Put mud on your eyes, go wash them off, then you can see. That God would still be blind to his death if he'd have never washed his eyes. The miracle wasn't in Jesus touching his eyes. I ain't preaching heresy. The miracle happened when the man obeyed the word that Jesus gave him, go wash her. Anyways, that's not part of this. Who said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I snatched you out of your oppressors. I drove you from before, before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the God of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you've not listened. So God's just, let, I just want to remind you how we got here. He's going to fix it, but he's, I just, that's one of my favorite part of this story, that God's just like, just reminding you. You got it. Okay, we're on the same page. Now we're going to fix this. He said, then the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abizarite. Ab Ab These names, wow. Where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a rind press. That's not, you don't thresh wheat in a wine press. But they had, they were living in this shrinking mentality, so he was even threshing wheat in a cave to keep it from the Midianites. He was living in fear. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. That's the part of the passage we usually preach that God sees in you what you don't see in yourself. 
Aren't you grateful? But Sir Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all the wonders that our fathers told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us into the hand of Midian. God hadn't abandoned them. Israel didn't want God's help. And the Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I, am I not sending you? But the Lord, but Lord getting asked, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest and Manasseh and I'm the least. In other words, he's like, I'm the, we're the runt clan and I'm the run of the runt clan. Like I'm nobody. I just love that because that's what God specializes in. People that can't see the image of God in them. God sees it in them. God saw the diamond before the pressure came in you. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down the Midianites together. You'll strike them all down. I love how God didn't even respond to Gideon's insecurity. He'll use you insecure. All right, three things real quick, and then we're going to wrap up. Number one is, how do, I, how do I get out of the cave? Number one, I listen to the voice of God. I listened to the voice of God. He said, God is with you. Mighty warrior. The angel of the Lord spoke to him. God's with you. In other words, God wasn't afar off this whole time. God was just waiting on them to ask. Waiting on them to listen. God hadn't abandoned them. God hadn't taken a vacation from them. But it's listening to the voice of God. You've got to listen to the voice of God. How do I listen to the voice of God? I listen to it through his word. I listen to it. Where does God, God speaks through his word. God speaks in his house. That's why it's so important to be in church every Sunday. Why? Because that may be the Sunday that the word will be spoken that you need. That's why it's so important. God speaks through his word. God speaks through worship. God speaks through godly people. That's why community is so important. Godly community around you is so important. Why? God speaks through his people. And God's voice will speak to your potential. God's voice will speak to your purpose. God's voice is not the voice of condemnation. Maybe conviction. But it's not the voice of condemnation. you got to listen to the voice of God. Number two, start with what you have. He said, go in the strength you have. Some of you are waiting to come out of the cave until you got it all mapped out. No, no, no. Start with what you have. In other words, go doubting. Go scared. Go without the full plan. I'm not talking about irresponsibility. Are you following me? But I'm talking about you got to start with what you have. If you wait till you have everything to go, you'll never go. you got to start where you're at. Start with what you have. Start with where you are. Start with what you can do. Don't, don't focus so much on what you can't do and what you don't have and what, what is limiting. No, no. Just start with what you have and step out. You may step out scared. You may step out feeling like I, I'm, I'm not sure that I'm the guy or the girl. No, no. Just step out with what you have. Start where you have. And number three, trust that God is going with you. He said, Gideon, we're going to go do this. I'll be with you. And if God's with you, that's all you need. So trust that God is with you. Trust that the same God that led Egypt out of slavery is the same God that is with you today. It's not a different God. Are you following me? The same God. It's the same God that, that was the cloud by day and fire by night. That same God is with you right now. The same God that caused Goliath to fall is the same God that is with you right now in this moment. The same God that, that spoke in and created the world, that same God is with you right now. The same God that, that created all that you see, that breathed you, that, that breathed life into you, that same God, it's that same God. The same God that caused Jericho walls to fall down, that same God. That same God. And some of you are like, Pastor, but I don't even know if I can do any of this because my cave have become a tomb. And I feel like things have died. Well, I've got good gospel news for you. Our God specializes in turning tombs into testimonies. Lazarus was dead for four days. They said he probably smells by now. And you may think there's so much dead stuff in me, I may stink. And he said, Lazarus, come out. Why? Because he specializes in resurrection. He specializes in bringing life into dead places. So come out of the cave. The Israelites came out of the cave. Lazarus, a tomb, was but a cave. He specializes in bringing people out. Of caves, but you gotta listen to the voice of God. You gotta start with what you got. You gotta trust. It's the point where your faith and God's faithfulness collide. That the same God 
who did it for them and the same God who's done it for other people around you is the same God that will do it in your life today. Do you receive the word today? Do you receive it today?